Um, thanks everyone for, for, for joining or tuning in today and really pleased to be able to restart these series called Intersectionality, Un Intersectionality Unfiltered. But really excited to be joined by Phil Harper, who's currently a senior lecturer in healthcare management at Arden University. Uh, before working in education, Phil has worked in hospital settings, charities and care facilities where they specialised in and led dementia care. Uh, Phil has in recent years worked at several higher education institutions slash universities and often speaks at national conferences and takes part in international working groups. Phil's currently studying a doctorate where they aim to explore care staff's understanding of the needs of LGBTQ plus people living with dementia, especially gender non-conforming individuals. Um, Phil, I'm so pleased to be connected with you today. I know we've kind of been following each other on, on social media, uh, on the social media verse for some time, but it's good to actually be here in this virtual space with you. So I, I guess just uh, if you'd like to share a little bit about who you are, Phil, um, your your kind of professional experiences, your work and, and what kind of intersectionality means to you. Thank you. So, um, yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to take part in this. Um, but for me, intersectionality, um, I'm trying to remember, I know when you sent me the question, trying to remember when I first read or saw it, and I can't really remember. It's kind of always been a little bit in the background. Um, I, I remember watching the video from um, Kimberly on Crenshaw on... Um, on i think it's the tedx talk that she done and um that really just opened up so many um like it just got my mind going really quite a lot with other areas um but i also do remember reading no hierarchy of oppressions by audre lord and for me that also was really succinct and this idea of how the oppressed people fought we fight between ourselves because that is what the oppressing right does. It makes us fight each other. And for me, that alongside, alongside Crenshaw's work just really reinforced this need for intersectionality and the fact that we shouldn't be fighting between us. We should be understanding complexities. It's not just one person's issues. And we should also be looking at that lived experience and lived experience and the complexity that comes with lived experience, which means that, as I said, it's not just one person's issue. So I kind of put, thought those things together um, and then it really has fed into my work quite a lot because I'm looking at people living with dementia and people the LGBTQ plus community and looking how that ageism um, disability and then obviously sexuality and gender identity all of that crosses over to create these unique experiences and then on one of my supervisions I was really lucky that one of my supervisors introduced me to the word of the work of I believe it's Floria Anthias who looks at translocational positionality which has really opened up so many different areas and this idea that our identity the way we see our identity changes in different cultures settings environment and our positionality within that can change and the complexity that intersectionality can bring with that so you might feel comfortable for example with dementia in a care setting but then actually as an lgbtq plus person you might not feel comfortable and vice versa in an lgbtq plus person as an older person you might not feel comfortable so how these different settings cultures environments how you see yourself and how you interact with your identity and who you are changes and how intersectionality is very much needed within that conversation Thanks so, so much. That <laughs> no, absolutely. And I think one of the one of the things that really struck me is, as you were talking was this notion that uh, or that that kind of idea that the oppressed people kind of turn on each other in some ways. And we have we have seen some of that, I think. Um, I just wondered in a, in a world where there's almost a competition of inequality or my inequality mm -hmm. is worse than yours, kind of in some some spaces. What 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 kind of your reflections on that from from that? Are there things we can do to help kind of counter now, you know, create a counter narrative to that? Are there, what what kind of your thoughts are on that? Do you think? Um. Yeah. No. It, it's something that really really strike or it has struck me as well. Um. And it really frustrates me, particularly when you start hearing people. Yeah. There's always this want to be a hierarchy of oppression. And again, as I said, that's what. Audre Law talks so much about and I think we still have that now and everybody wants to one-up each other it's like I'm more oppressed than you and I think that's what causes a lot of the issues we have and it's like whereas actually if we just looked at what that shared feeling of being oppressed is 
surely we just hold hands and fight against the oppression together instead of trying to compete within us. Um, but I also do think that that's our fault. I think the oppressed people do that to us on purpose. That's been created. It's kind of this discussion, this argument between oppressed groups is fabricated by the oppressors personally. So I don't think that's as oppressed people, that's necessarily our fault. I think we we are being manipulated to do that to a certain degree. And I think once we notice that, hopefully there'll be the power then to try and not be manipulated, basically. So that's my view on it. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think that's it's it's really fair an astute observation. I think um we have to think about the, the the system in which impression takes place right and then look at ways of just deconstructing it or as people like to, to call it dismantling the things or, or institutions and stuff like that yeah. so i totally see where that is i also kind of think of uh, like bell hooks's work and the way in which sort of like how do you create spaces of compassion and and loving spaces and stuff like that as a form of action and resistance as well uh, and i do wonder if that gets it gets lost sometimes when, when we're in this space, which is always quite interesting. So um, you talked a little bit as well about the, the your doctorate and your research area in and looking at multiple intersecting identities and, and kind of systems, particularly in the health sector. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you could share a little bit about how maybe intersectionality has helped inform your current research or where, mm -hmm. where what kind of stage are you at at the moment with that? So I'm still very early on in my research. I've had to take a bit of a break due to um, personal and just work issues. But I'm currently really exploring these ideas and reading literature and just letting it organically develop. And intersectionality is one of those things that's actually kind of helping me to develop even more. Because, again, this idea of that translocational positionality and the idea that actually different settings maybe support different aspects of the, our um, identity and how we change in our views and our positionality changes based on where we move, different times, cultures, and everything that's happening around us. Um, I think poses really different, different perspectives on intersectionality because I think for me, very traditional intersectionality feels quite, can or can feel, it not always, but can feel quite static. Whereas this actually shows the moving and the fluid nature of intersectionality a lot more. And it shows that actually those different aspects of our identity is always changing as we move through our life and different places as well. Um, so I think that is quite often where I'm looking at intersectionality and just trying to really promote that fluid nature of it and how um how intersectionality is that and i think it originally always has been that fluid nature but i think people adopt it to be very static and i think it's about reminding people no it's not a static thing because you have different experiences different oppression based on different let's say areas and different places of work and or different places of being cared for um and i think it's about remembering again that fluid nature and i think that's what's really influenced my work particularly when people are getting older maybe getting dementia getting different conditions different comorbidities going into different settings and how different aspects of somebody's identity and how people see themselves within that changes and how we need to think about um cultures and ways of supporting somebody so i do a lot of work around microaggressions as well and how these microaggressions can make cultures really unsupportive and lead to people having internalized um issues etc so um it's very much about how that moving identity alongside these microaggressions and care cultures within my research can sometimes make it difficult for somebody and understanding all the different aspects of somebody that might be coming out at different times due to that fluid nature if that makes sense uh, yeah no that, that that really does it's it's so interesting and and something that kind of struck me as well because you you're focused your research is kind of focused on the health kind of health setting mm. is that right and and i guess i'm just quite interested to see just out of curiosity, what is the proportion of those? Because your fo your focus is on looking at LGBTQ plus people living with dementia. Is there mm. is that kind of a what is the number there roughly, or is it quite a, quite a big proportion of, of patients that live with this um, that, mm. that identifies LGBTQ plus in some way? Um, I was just kind of curious to know if there was um, indication because it's, it's such a it's such a specific area. Um, so I wondered how that kind of came about and 
Has that related to your previous health practice in terms of what you observed over time as well in some ways? So I didn't mean to put you on the spot with stats. <laughs> no, no, it's okay. No, um, I, I've got it really quickly to hand off. Um, <laughs> put this together so many times. These statistics. So, basically, I, I do have the gout course. So actually, we don't collect this information. So there are actually no, no real accurate statistics on this. However, if you do a little bit of mental gymnastics and work out the amount of people um, living with dementia, the amount of um, LGBTQ plus people, you could generally get a rough idea because people don't stop being LGBTQ plus when they get older, which kind of goes hand in hand with my whole um, thought process behind my research. Um, but there could be around 85,714 gay and lesbian people, and that's not taken into account bisexual or trans or gender diverse people. So we are still thinking of fairly high numbers um, I think my personal experience, so for me personally, I'm non-binary um, and I've always worried about getting older and actually whether they, whether social care is really set up to support me. And that's kind of what pushed me into this area is bringing my professional life of being a dementia care professional and then going into dementia care academia um, and then actually thinking, but what about my personal experience? And, what will it be like for me? And that's kind of what pushed me into it. It's my own positionality within my research, really. Um, and yeah, and the more I look into it, it's so heteronormative. And it just worries me a little bit that everything is so over pathologized and everything's focused on dementia care, looking after the dementia, but people forget about sexuality, gender identity, many other things, um, particularly. So it doesn't take that intersectional approach. It is that very over pathologized approach, in particular with gender neutrality and non binary identities. People just think, oh, it's the dementia, somebody can't present their gender. And you're like, no, maybe this person is gender non conforming. They like to dress like this. And I think we, we miss this. And there's so many other examples that we miss that we just look at it being dementia. And it's very similar into like the intellectual disability or learned disability world. We share quite a lot of. Um, like that over pathologization there as well and over focus on cognitive decline and not thinking about other aspects of somebody's life so that's really what i want to do with my research is try and just open up that discourse really and that discussion that we it's not just about the dementia but think about other aspects of somebody's life too yeah that, that that's so interesting and something that that kind of really sticks out for me is when you talked about you talked about this particular notion of positionality mm. and you use this particular theory i think it was trans something translocational positionality <laughs> translocational positionality and and i wonder um for, for a lot of us in doing this sort of kind of inclusion work in some ways or looking at ways we we kind of bring social justice about to affect mm. change for for people right um we traverse personal and professional boundaries um, you know, we, our personal spaces kind of often morph into our professional and then our professional mm. morphs into our personal. And I wondered how have you kind of found navigating that? Because I, from my perspective, I've been doing anti-racist work for some time, mm. but I've really had to be, over the last few years, be really even more kind of cautious about how I don't let the two things blur, otherwise you just lose your well-being. And I just wondered how, how have you kind of been in navigating that space between personal and professional it's just something you alluded to there um i would say i've kind of just hit it head on and just really merged it and i think in one way that's worked i think because i've just totally like i go to work in drag i do lectures in drag i i was the face of arden university during pride month in drag and i bring my whole self to work and I think because I'm work lucky enough to work for a provider or an organization that allows me to do that, in one way, totally blurring the two has worked. However, I don't I think you have to be able to totally blur it or kind of keep it together. That's my feel anyway. Like I I'm really lucky that I can mix a lot of my activism and my drag is definitely activism. I'm not really much of a lip sync. I do poetry and I do a lot of talks. So very much that ties in with my academic work um so i've been really lucky that i've been able to mix that um but i do think sometimes it is also depending on where you are and that kind of fits with that translocational positionality because for example if i went 
and done a talk somewhere maybe if i'd done a talk in dubai or something i'd have to be very careful about my identity for example so actually in that sense my job might bring me to places for example or other organizations that aren't quite as inclusive or in different spaces where i might have to be a bit more reserved um so i think there is there are definitely it, I think it's about, for me, I, I'm lucky to be in an organisation that lets me to be my whole self. And that's what keeps my well-being positive with merging my personal life in with my research, because I'm allowed to talk about my personal life. And as a lecturer who mainly focuses on equality and diversity in health and social care, I can talk a lot about my experiences and I can open up with my students and we can have that shared discussion but I think, again, I'm just lucky that I'm in that position I can. I think in other aspects and in other um, roles, it might not be possible. And I think it can be, you could definitely have that conflict. You can have that really difficult feeling of actually how much of me do I bring to work and get involved in my work? Because if something goes wrong, it could be really upsetting. If something, let, let's say, if I was to be teaching and I heard something really um discriminatory it can be really hard and and i have had that in the past particularly hearing sometimes transphobia and as a non-binary person it can be really hard to listen but then i think i think it's just knowing that i've got a good team a good organization that really supports you gives you that strength for that i don't know if that did answer your um question yeah. but it did and and i think you're it's so it's really refreshing to actually because i hear a lot of people trying to almost compartmentalize mm -hmm. their kind of inclusion work from personal to professional and i've definitely been in that that boat where i've tried to separate the two because i just couldn't i needed a break from the nine to five kind of thing um but actually it's nice to be able to hear that you've been able to kind of also collide them together in some ways mm -hmm. and actually you've been in the, you're in an organization that embraces all of you right and i think that's mm -hmm. all that's what we're trying to all uh, or kind of like strive for um, in different organisations and places of work as well. So I think it's it's nice to hear that even though you would have faced some adversities, of course, but like you've still been able to bring your whole self to your work your, your, and your life, which I think is really, really cool. It's so nice to hear. I guess um, one of the things I did kind of, kind of just dawned on me as well, though, is so you've been lecturing in drag and you've you've been doing it out of drag as well and how has that experience been from from your perspective and is that something you, you did recently or yeah well, i'm just really curious to know about that so yeah i i first done my first lecture in drag when i worked at um a previous organization i was teaching sexuality for social work students and i thought i'd make it a really immersive teaching experience to try and bring some lived experience basically to the teaching actually what would the social workers feel like if they walked into somebody who's trans at somebody who is a drag queen by profession and i th and i got the students to reflect a lot on um what it was like being taught by a drag queen which you just didn't expect and i think it is about opening up your eyes to the diversity that is in the world and if we can make it as immersive in a safe way as possible like obviously you've got to think about the safety of the people you're involving to show the diversity but thankfully i was in a position i could do that but if you can open those eyes up to the world it's so incredibly powerful um and i think my feeling is i I'm really comfortable lecturing in and out of drag. And I think it it feels different and it gives a different message. Like I generally do my drag teaching when I'm teaching LGBT stuff um, because I think it's very, again, it adds that immersive aspect. And for me, it makes me feel quite powerful because I'm stood up here looking quite powerful teaching something that's really passionate really important and it's and i can bring my personal experiences in and show my personal experiences not just talk about it but show it um and i think that's really important and it's something that i'm really passionate about when i'm working um around my teaching is about how can i have this authentic voice and show how it is from the voice of the people who we are talking about not from for example my white perspective if i want to talk about cultural diversity i want it to come from those cultures or different cultures different voices and it can i don't always have to bring someone in the room it can be through youtube videos it can be through just allowing people to say their story not 
me talking about it as a white person the same as when i'm in drag and i'm talking it from a queer perspective coming from a queer person not from a straight cisgendered person and i think that is so massively empowering and i think that's what i find so important about being able to bring your whole self to work and be able to bring being allowed and supported and having that opportunity to bring your whole self to work basically particularly in teaching yeah i think that's great and i think it's a really nice example of being able as teachers as lecturers to bring all of your kind of tools and resources to create and cultivate a learning space to you know i always think of like you know universities are here to liberate transform society so if we're not using or utilizing all the amazing talents that lecturers mm -hmm. and, and those that are teaching students have then what, what are we really here mm -hmm. for because the world is really complicated so we're gonna have to be more complicated in our approach right mm -hmm. so um I, I think that's it's a really nice thing to, to kind of see in, in terms of again that authentic you bring yourself bring your whole self to, to, to the classroom in some ways and I guess just from your experience and from your research and, and your kind of reflections as well, what would you say are sort of the kind of main issues um, around intersectionality um, and, and maybe more broadly around inclusion and in, in what you've experienced? Are there any particular things that you think we need to kind of highlight? I think I think we've already really touched on it. I think it's this hierarchy and this competition. For me, this is something that this is it's probably the first thing that I see. You see people and they will talk about um, equality and diversity issues in like silos in a way. And they'll have their tunnel vision on their one issue that people are focused on. And we all have our specials and we all have our lived experience and we can't speak on everything. But you just see so many people just talking about it like it doesn't exist with anything else, which is the total opposite to what we're talking about, intersectionality. But I think it is just the lack of intersectionality is the issue, really, is that quite often people get really or just stay very focused on one area. And I understand why, particularly when it's such a personal thing, if you've experienced a certain type of oppression, that it kind of you you kind of get on your soapbox in a little bit but you you're just trying to defend yourself and you're bringing yourself into that work i understand why um and i think but sometimes i think we need to have these shared discussions and we need to have this wider discussion about that how do we all face this and then as they're working together a little bit more um but i also have this and it's probably a little bit of a controversial view and i see it quite a lot on linkedin this debate is are we edi experts or are we just experts in our own lived experience or our own focus because i think edi again it's very much like the lgbtq acronym the hated bame acronym all those sort of things like can we be a specialist in all of that and no we can't really we can focus we can promote it but can we be a specialist and this old idea of becoming an all-encompassing and an all-knowledgeable edi expert which you see quite often banded around i i don't fully agree that we can be i think we can have a specialism in something but i don't know if we could be an expert in it and i think we can promote it but i think and then that leads on to really i think we need more collaboration but so i think it really a lot of it comes on to me about collaboration there's not enough collaboration we all compete with each other and also edi specialists compete with each other so i think we compete and don't collaborate and i think that is across protected characteristics i think it's across just the work we do in general and i think there just needs to be far more collaboration for us to really have that overview yeah, I, I do think it's a controversial view. I, I think it's a it's it's a it's a fair observation. You know, there's been such a significant investment in the the kind of EDI <laughs> brackets, right? Um, huge amounts, director roles everywhere, um, teams getting loads of investment, which is good, right? It's it's good we're in that direction. But at the same time, the amount of um, I remember even maybe a year or two ago, and the amount of jobs which said EDI looking for a generalist right under the job description i was thinking what does that really mean what are you trying mm -hmm. to achieve here yeah they've got yeah these big firms have got these huge like solidarity anti-racist statements or these huge like trans inclusion statements and you're like but you just want an edi generalist so what what do you expect mm -hmm. to achieve um when this is not really a professionalized career path mm -hmm. in any way shape form you know for now anyway mm -hmm. um 
And what are we what are we actually trying to do, or is this just another performative thing? Mm -hmm. Right. I remember meeting uh, a couple of diversity officers who are on their own in the entire organization, running the entire diversity work of an organization of, a, of kind of medium size. It's like 250 plus right stuff. And I was just thinking, how on earth are you managing to even do that with how are you meeting the needs of everyone as a generalist when you haven't even got it right or can't get it right or haven't got the resources to get it right or the skill? to do it for one group, you know? So I, I think you're right. I think that collaboration is so, so important. Um, and and I, I guess just like from, from what are your thoughts on how we could collaborate more? Because um, I do feel like there sometimes is a bit of a disconnect between mm. inclusion, the inclusion space sometimes between what lots of people are doing. I wonder if you've got any thoughts on how we could be a bit more connected in some ways. I think for me, it's just listening to each other. I whenever I try and talk to other people who are working in EDI generally, as it's like what you said, we can't cover every single protected characteristic um, realistically. So it's about listening to each other and having that willing to listen to each other. And I think sometimes that involves difficult listening, um, difficult conversations, but I think holding a space for difficult conversations and actually listening to it i think if you're willing to do that i think even if you only cover one protected characteristic you can be a good edi leader because you're willing to actually listen to the voices and platform the voices so you not try and over speak on different voices know your limits and again listen for me that's the big thing know your limits and listen to the people who can help you yeah, I think it's, it's it's really helpful, and I think um, outside of conferences, which can be quite, it can almost exacerbate the competition sometimes of who's doing inclusion better. In fact, no one really is yet. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a few there's a few good practices, right? Mm -hmm. But there's not like a, a gold star for anyone at this point. Um, but I just kind of wondered, uh, yeah, the, where those spaces exist for for us to listen to each other um, and to connect with one another. Maybe we can find a way to, to, to do that more, maybe outside of that conference or presenting space, which which allows for that to happen. Um, I know there are certain groups, but then they still seem overly strategic and less about community. Um, so maybe something without purpose might be quite nice. Well, not <laughs> entry criteria to these groups. You have to be a certain company or you have to be this and that. And it's just like, it'd be so nice to be able to have just really relaxed meetups for example where you can just chat over what you've been thinking and a bit like this because it's been just so nice and informal chat where you can just talk about things and even just as if you are the person doing a lot of the talking you learn from your own talking as well sometimes yeah I've, i always feel like um i'm definitely one of those people that can talk things out and then come up with ideas right and mm -hmm. i think I, I don't know if, if, from your perspective, one of the things that I think has been really interesting is the kind of, um, I get kind of frustrated with the lack of bravery in developing kind of inclusion programs or actions or interventions. And I just wonder if that's something that you've kind of come across, that kind of fear of not being able to, well, it's almost like that, that notion of the institution's happy to put yeah. their, their name to a PR statement, right? As we've seen it before. But then when I mean, it comes down to actually getting into the, you know, getting the hands dirty, so to speak, yeah. there's this kind of like complete fear that, that that kind of takes over of certain groups. I just wonder if that's something that you've experienced and how you've managed to kind of overcome that at all. I think it is. And it's I've even experienced that fear, fear because I think the difficulty is like particularly in my area, like in LGBT, you say all oh, one gay person experiences this, but that's just how that one person experiences it. And it's the same across everything. And you then try and put in a policy or you try and put in a way of doing that. You're trying to be as inclusive as you are and you will always exclude somebody. So I think the fear of putting your neck out and saying, oh, this is what we've done because I think it can be quite a cutthroat world and sometimes your intentions get lost but partly because there are non-honourable intentions a lot of um like self-promoting egotistical intentions out there but when you actually do want to try and make a difference you also get cut down at the same time and i think it 
makes it just a very cutthroat world. And I think people are fearful to put out what they're doing out there. But I think bravery is needed. And I think you do need to sometimes put your head on the line. And But as well, social media is scary. Like Twitter, it, it's pretty savage. Like I know if, um, if you put out something pro-trans, you will get a lot of hate on Twitter quite often. The amount of my colleagues that I'll show their solidarity to the trans community and then have to lock their account down because the amount of hate that they get is crazy so in one way should we have to be brave or should we and i think it's one of these difficult worlds when we're in such a turbulent di divided and toxic like world at the moment like i think that has a massive impact yeah no yeah i completely hear that it, it, it's it's scary i think sometimes how uh how polarized the arguments are and particularly for example like the trans rights kind of i don't even want to call it debate to kind of i don't want to call it that but i know it is for a lot of people mm -hmm. um but the arguments are so polarized and that's just one example i think of of, of yep. different polarized views um you know we have polarized arguments to and for uh, for, uh, for and against institutional racism for example mm. arguments and other areas of rights-based kind of thinking so it's a huge kind of sensitive area so yeah so, so uh, and i also wonder yeah you're absolutely right in the sense that who who is who are we asking to be brave and how are we supporting them uh and are we asking the right people to be brave uh, mm. So, or inviting the right people to be brave. Um, so maybe that's that's probably another conversation, mm -hmm. or maybe something for another PhD. But definitely, I'm I'm not going to be doing a second PhD. That's <laughs> <what I thought>. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, I guess Phil, just uh, on that note, and it's been so interesting hearing from you so far. But I just wonder if you had any final thoughts or sort of kind of take home messages for anyone listening or, or kind of watching this today about your thoughts on intersectionality or just your kind of reflections generally on, on inclusion more broadly as well. I think it's just to remember that it's fluid and you when we're thinking about it, we need to be remembering that we're in an ever-changing world and we're ever-changing ourselves as well um how we see ourselves is always changing dependent on how the wider world sees us and that adds a bit a lot of complexity to how we work in EDI but I think we need to remember that and not look at people are static beings and you you need to have a bit of flexibility in your policies the way you work and how you support people that everybody can be supported and within a fluid way that's my view anyway i love that thank you so much for sharing and thank you so much for joining as well it's been so great speaking with you today and thank you so much for having me i've really really enjoyed it okay i will stop recording there